Good morning. Um, this morning's scripture is found in according to Mark chapter 8, starting in verse 1. Uh, if you didn't bring a Bible, there's one under your seat. And if you don't have a Bible, um, please feel free to take that one home with you. So we're in Mark 8, and we're going to do 1 through 21. In those days, when again a great crowd had gathered, and they had nothing to eat, Jesus called his disciples to him and said to them, I have compassion on the crowd, because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them had come from far away. And his disciples answered him, Who is able to feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? They said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people. And they set them before the crowd. And they had a few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate and were satisfied. And they took up of the broken pieces left over seven baskets full. And there were about 4,000 people. And he sent them away. And immediately he got into a boat with his disciples and went to the district of Domanthua. The Pharisees came and began to argue with him, seeking from him a sign from heaven to test him. And he sighed deeply in his spirit and said, Why does this generation seek a sign? Truly, I say to you, no sign will be given to this generation. And he left them, got into a boat again, and went to the other side. Now they had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. And he cautioned them, saying, Watch out, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And they began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread. And Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why are you discussing the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet perceive or understand? Are your hearts hardened? Having eyes, do you not see? And having ears, do you not hear? And do, do you not remember? When I broke the five loaves for the 5,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? They said to him, 12. And the seven for the 4,000, how many baskets full of broken pieces did you take up? And they said to him, seven. And he said to them, do you not yet understand? This is God's word. Amen. Amen. So this very busy passage in Mark's biography about Jesus presents to us three different life values. Uh, what's sweet, what's solitary, and what's known as grace. Three different life values. And if that sounds sort of uh, heady, abstract, kind of out there, actually what we value dictates what we do in life. So most of you know exactly what you're going to do, where you're going to go when the service ends this morning, right? So some of you will go straight to your home, and that decision is based on what you value. You may value comfort, for example. Like you may feel like your home makes you feel comforted after a socially anxious situation. You're around a lot of people and you want to get home. You may, you may value familiarity or predictability. Because you feel like you need that in your life or in your kid's life because you got to get them in kid's ministry immediately afterwards. You may need rest, and that's the reason you go home or you stay home. Some of you are, in fact, watching from home potentially because you value rest. You wanted to sleep in this morning. I get it. A couple of you are even in this building, even value rest so much that you may even nod off before I throw up my first bullet point this morning. <laughs> All right? So, with that having been said... There are some of you, however, who are going to run an errand or two as soon as you get done with, with this this morning because you value efficiency. Maybe you value the environment. You value, uh, you value your wallet. And so that's why you're going to save time, save money, save all these things, right? Some of you value and you're going to stick around for lunch after church today. We've got a wonderful lunch going on. And you do that because maybe you value community. You value being included. You value connecting with other people or meeting new people. Or maybe you just value not having to make something for yourself <laughs> when you get home. Hey, it's a free meal, right? Might as well stay. I agree with you. The point is, even our most mundane, 
right? Even our next decisions, perhaps, are dictated by what we value. And behind what we value is what we believe about ourselves and the world we live in. In this series of events we read this morning, we see people who value what's sweet because they, so, they believe so strongly that love, but not power, is what's going to give them meaning. It's what's going to give them satisfaction. We see people value what's solitary because they believe a power without love is going to give them meaning. It's going to satisfy them. Then we're going to see people who value grace because they believe a love that's lit is going to give them a sense of meaning and satisfaction in life. We're going to look at each value. And along the way, I'm going to profile someone I know, someone I met, who fits the description of each value. So first, let's talk about this first life value of sweet, love without power. Easter's coming up, as we mentioned previously, and I remember as a kid, I relished the, the sweet Easter candies called Peeps. Anybody remember Peeps? Oh, dear Lord, Peeps, man. I mean, th these were marshmallows coated with sugar granules, all right? So sugar on sugar violence, really. Uh, I, I no longer love Peeps. Empty calories, and my body has definitively told me, Ryan, this is food without power, all right, it is just let me know through, my, through the reaction I get now that I'm in my 40s and I have something like that. Oh, no, that is not happening. There's a kind of love that's like that, right? A kind of love that's like sweets or candies. They let off a quick boost, but they don't produce any kind of long-term good. A younger friend of mine named Andrew, we were in touch this week, and he, he is going from one job, transitioning to another job. And because of that, he was letting me know, he, he was talking to me about how he went down to Mardi Gras in New Orleans. And he wasn't sharing this with me because of the booze or because of the women down there, per se, but because the trip, he said, he was transformative through the people he met and through the people he got to, to love on and demonstrate love towards. It was transformative in his life. And in his words, he said, it restored his faith in humanity. This is his words. He said, it, was, it was like, Ryan, we, we all signed on to live in love and harmony, and it leads me to believe that we can really do this as a people. Now, my friend Andrew, it was nice to hear from him, and I was glad to hear from him. I love this guy, but with a little life, more life experience than he has, I can say confidently that is way too much faith in humanity, <laughs> way too much faith. Most of these people will travel back to their same homes, and 99% of them will drift back into the same habits they had before going down to Mardi Gras. Because vacations and good times and places almost never transform a person, do they? Quick boost, sure. Sugar high, absolutely. It's love without power. The first words we hear from those closest to Jesus, his closest friends, these disciples, 12 of them, they say in verse 4, who is able to feed these people with bread here in this desolate place? Consider, them asking this question. Now, they ask this question, who's able to do this? Consider that just days, at most weeks before, Jesus fed way more people with just a few loaves and a few fish. It's literally the only miracle that Jesus virtually duplicates verbatim. And they just saw it happen. And yet they ask the question, their first question to him is, what, Jesus, who is able to do this? He's standing right in front of them, <laughs> right? The word used here for who is able is, is, who able is dunamis. Dunamis, if that term sounds familiar, what does dunamis sound like? It's where we get our English word dynamite. In other words, the disciples are asking, who has the power, who has the kind of dynamite that will transform this situation, 4,000 people with no food? See, friends, that they trust that Jesus loves them, I and mean, he selected them, he invited them to be involved in his ministry, but they still don't trust that he has the power to transform anything, any person, at any time. Still don't get that yet. And we see this again when they get back in the boat for a second time. They've forgotten to bring bread with them on the boat this time around. We hear that Jesus then starts to teach them. In verse 15. But after he's done with his main point, notice what happens. Did you read that? They start up the discussion again about not having enough bread. Jesus teaches them something profound. They're like, yeah, but where's our bread? 
Let's talk about bread again. I'm worried about bread. They are consumed with worry about a lack of provision. Jesus may love them, but in their eyes, they still lack. They still don't have, and they want to have. So Jesus confronts them. He says, hey, man, do you guys remember the 5,000, the loaves for the 5,000 people? They're like, yeah. Wasn't there so much bread that we had leftovers? They said, yeah, 12 baskets left over. Wasn't there so much bread? Left over after the feeding of the 4,000, they said, yeah, yeah, seven baskets left over. And he asked the question, do you still not understand? Now, what exactly was he asking them to understand? Well, Mark lets us as his readers know. Look again at verse 16, if you will, there in your Bible. They began discussing with one another the fact that they had no bread Now go back to verse 14. They had forgotten to bring bread, and they had only one loaf with them in the boat. What do you notice that's sort of off about those two verses? Verse 16, no bread, right? Verse 14, one loaf. What's going on here? Mark Mark is saying, Jesus is y'all's bread. He is the bread of life. He is the one loaf you need. The only provision you need right now is in the boat. Jesus, he has done it before. He'll do it again. He, he's the one who can show you love with power. He's the one who says, love you. He's got the bread you need. He is the one who will make his love active and provide everything that you need. Not just love, not just tenderness, but a love with power. You might have come here this morning wanting to just feel better about your life, and I get that. You want to get a little boost, a little a little sugar high, and if so, friend, you may need to duck because Jesus is coming at you with this transformative love. That's the only way he knows how to love, and that's what he brings. There's a second life value we see here this morning, and it's solitary. It's power without love. Not too long ago, I got to sit down with this wonderful older gentleman. Uh, he's lived a very successful life, uh, he has had a very uh, analytic mind and really enjoyed sitting down with him and, and, and talking with him. He's got a religious background, but not in Christianity. And he's just at the point in his life where he, he's searching and he's asking questions. And specifically, he's looking for proof, proof of God, proof of what's real. And I, I talked to him about the, the reasonable evidence for the resurrection of Jesus And during our discussion, he asked a lot about miracles, and he specifically asked, you know, why don't we see miracles a lot today? Why don't we see, like, big things happen, like you you kind of read about in the Bible? And He said he felt like if if I just had a sign, it would help me believe. At the end, so at the end, I I gave him this book, and he was appreciative of it. He opened a page, and the title of the section was a question that he had. And he said, he said, it's a sign. It's a sign. And I understand where he's coming from in that completely. Now, I pray that this man, I genuinely pray every day that this man's life will be transformed. But very likely, it will not be through a sign. In our text, the religious leaders confront Jesus, asking for a sign from heaven, right? They want this sign. He had performed a couple signs from them previously, but they didn't make them follow Jesus. In fact, at one point during Jesus' baptism, they publicly hear a voice from heaven say, this is my beloved son, with him I am well pleased. And you'd think if you heard a voice from heaven say, hey, here he is, you'd believe and you'd trust, but they don't. Because signs don't help a person believe unless they're also open to a transformative relationship. You have to have the openness to say, I I don't want to just believe, I want, to, I want to change, I want to transform, I want to be someone different than I am right now. And One commentator gave a really helpful analogy for this, I thought. Um, he said that if a man hires a private investigator, all right, to, to, to sort of spy on his wife, for her, to, to prove her faithfulness, the PI's proofs are hardly going to make a difference if the, to make the man trust her. If there's no trust in the relationship itself, right? That dude's going to have to keep paying that private investigator for months and years to come, right? Because he's going to keep on half the furnished proofs that she's being faithful, right? That's going to be really expensive. 
Jesus saying to, to these Pharisees, to these religious leaders, that's enough, I've given you enough signs to make a relationship possible. No more signs. It's clear that no amount of signs will do. One of my heroes of the faith, a man named Augustine, back fourth century, bishop, whatever, he, he said, he was famous for saying, I believe in order to understand. I believe in order to understand. And a way of saying that a little more simply in modern language would be, I'll trust and follow Jesus in relationship, and he'll furnish enough proofs for me along the way. What I, what I, I see him, I'll trust and follow him because of who he is. Who will give me the proofs I need in relationship with him? The issue with these religious leaders is they weren't looking for a transformational relationship. By specifically asking for a sign from heaven, almost all the commentators say what they really want is a sign to show that Israel is going to be victorious. Israel is going to be victorious and they're going to be the leaders of Israel. They want a sign on their behalf that would affirm their status as honored religious leaders of this nation. That's what they want. They want Jesus to affirm and help preserve their power while keeping him at arm's length. They don't really want Jesus. They want, like, what he can give to them. They want his endorsement, but not him. Jesus then later warns his disciples to beware of the leaven of the religious leaders and Herod. As with the religious leaders, Herod wanted to preserve power. He wanted to preserve autonomy while keeping Jesus at arm's length. You may recall, you may not, that's okay. We read earlier, weeks and weeks ago, that Herod first heard about Jesus. And when he first heard about Jesus, he thought, this must be John the Baptist, risen from the dead. Now, John the Baptist was a man, you may recall, that confronted Herod about his sin and the need to change his life. So what did Herod do? Oh, he kept him at arm's length. He wasn't allowed to live in the palace or in the area. He kept him away, arm's length. So when Jesus says, beware of the Pharisees, beware of Herod, he's saying, beware of coming to me on your own terms. Beware of that. Asking for a sign to confirm he's real so I, so I can... In some cases, just go on living my, my insulated life and, and my little kingdom, preserving my authority and my autonomy, my way of living. And friends, an insulated life is characterized by fear, isn't it? I want to I keep on doing I want to hold on to this. I want to hold on to what I have. I don't want change. I don't want someone to... Some of us, in doing so, we insulate ourselves from love. We insulate ourselves from a transformative love relationship so we can maintain the solitary kingdom of what we have that is power but without love. A final value we're going to see here in our passage, we see here in our passage, is, is grace. It's love lit. Love empowered. Going back again, that's why I put a little stick of dynamite lit here that says love on it. It's love empowered. Going back to that idea of, of dunamis, dynamite. It is a gift of love with a lit fuse. That's what grace is. My grandmother always gifted me greeting cards for my birthday and sometimes other special occasions as well. And in these greeting cards, she, she underlined words, including the words from the greeting card company, by the way, that she felt I really needed to read. Some were singles, some were doubles, sometimes triples. She underlined, underlined, underlined. And in those, she, she, she offered her own words of love and support and she included in the cards also uh, bookmarks with famous quotes from authors and inspirational little miniature cards with inspirational like, phrases and things like that. And in other words, there was a lot of required reading <laughs> whenever I got a card from my Nana. And I genuinely appreciated the words. Like, like I love them and I look back at it fondly. But she also included something quite useful, a $20 bill, Right? <laughs> That is, I mean, that is love that's lit, right? It's love that's empowered. Like, all of a sudden, there was an active power to my Nana's love, right? A power that can immediately impact my life. In this case, my social life. It was the gift of love, but with power. It made a difference. That is grace. 
God has decidedly communicated his words of love to us, right? In here, in the Bible. But he didn't just tell us about love up there from the throne. He did something about it. And we see that even in our passage this morning, right? When Jesus says, I have compassion on this crowd, he doesn't just say compassion. He does compassion. He then does compassion, doesn't he? And he did that to the uttermost. He came in the flesh to live the perfect life of love that we couldn't live. And because of love, he died the death that you and I deserved. And then he rose from the dead to prove all these promises of love, they're true. Forever forgiveness. And God with us always and no matter what. He didn't just say he loved us. He put that love into power. So for those who trust Jesus, God the Spirit lives inside of us due to this transformational renovation in us and, and to keep us loving even when people don't love us back. That is love with power. Without deserving it. He put us up on this pedestal to call us his children. He calls us an heir to his kingdom. That is power, but with love, right? What he calls us, what he names us forever, heirs and children. So in a nutshell this morning, if you remember nothing else, remember this. It's our message in a nutshell. Find grace by embracing Jesus. Not keeping him at arm's length. Find grace by embracing Jesus. Now you may hear that and you say, Ryan, man, of course I want grace. And who's going to turn down grace? Who's going to say, I, want to, I don't want a little more grace in my life, but, but do you really? Do you want grace? You come here this morning, you might, you might think, man, I, I want answers to prayer. I want God to use me when I open my mouth. I want him to help me in life, generally speaking, but that's far enough. Arm's length. Because I still want to stay the solitary king of my little kingdom. Right? And what you're saying is, I want power, but not the love. I don't want the transformative love relationship. Another hero of, of a faith of mine, a man named C.S. Lewis, was fond of saying, he talks about that approach to God is, is like a small home improvement project. You're expecting God to come in, he said, and, and fix a few you know, unclog some drains, F fix some, some leaky faucets. But when you embrace Jesus, it's a total renovation. <laughs> God comes in and he takes it down to the studs and back. But he builds a palace out of it, a palace fit for an heir to the kingdom. And that is what you are when you trust him. Now, this biography about Jesus, it was written in a different language from what we have here originally it was written in Greek. So when Jesus says to the crowd, they have been with me now for three days. That phrase, they have been with me, is, is an intensive, one, com one commentator says it's a rare and intensified expression. They, have been, they are really with me. In fact, it's the only place in Mark's biography about Jesus where crowd is used in a positive way. Every other time we hear about crowds, it's always negative. But here, it's saying, oh man, they are really with Jesus. Like they are in a, they are with him. Even though they're hungry and they're uncomfortable and they're in this desolate place, they are, they are in it for the love relationship they see in the person of Jesus. That's what they want. They want grace. They want that transformative love relationship. On the other hand, you may be here this morning and say, you know, I want to feel loved by God. I want that healthy self-esteem boost. I want that pick-me-up that I'm going to get on a Sunday morning. And I want you to give it to me, Ryan. I want you to give it to me, Brian, through the music. I want, that's what I want. You may want love, but without the power. And that's a, that's, it's a sweet sentimentalism, but it's not grace. Remember, grace is love that's lit. In a transformative love relationship, God may ask you to do strange things, hard things, even things that the world doesn't label as love. I mean, he wants to, but he will live inside of you to empower you to actually do those things, the hard things, the strange things. He will live inside you to give you the power to do it, not just the love. And so we read at the end of verse 9 that Jesus, after they're so close to him, he sends them away. And they go. 
This crowd is a lot like that Syrophoenician woman we read about a few weeks ago in chapter 7. And they're like her in a couple of ways. Number one, their hearts, the crowd's hearts, they're happy for scraps. They trust whatever provision Jesus gives them, whatever scraps he gives them from the table, that's all they need. This bread, this fish, and then you want us to go away, Jesus? We'll go. You send us away now, we trust you've given us what we need. So we'll go. The second way they're like that woman we read about is that they too are Gentiles. They're non-Jews. If you would read up a little bit in the context earlier in chapter 7, you'll see that at this point, Jesus is in a region known as the Decapolis or the Ten Cities east of the Sea of Galilee. This was a non-Jewish region. A non-Jewish region. Meaning once again, we see this theme pop up in Mark. The least likely people are the ones to embrace Jesus. It's the least likely. The ones you guess would be furthest from getting Jesus would be furthest away in desolate places. They get Jesus. They're the ones that get him. The ones in the desolate places. I promised you guys a third profile this morning. I talked about my friend Andrew with you. I talked about the, this, this wonderful analytic gentleman I got to meet with. My third profile is you. It's you, dear people. Petaluma Christian Church. I know because I've heard some of your stories. I've gotten the, pl- the honor to hear some of your journeys. One of you embraced Jesus from a life of heavy drinking. Another having been spared from death on the battlefield. Another from the summer of love in the 60s. Another from a home life of abuse and heartache. Another, having previously given your life over to, uh, to, to fun and frivolity and thinking that would, that would fill you up. Another, from the grips of a cult. Another, having vowed to have absolutely nothing to do with God ever in your life. These are all, friends, desolate places. We are the least likely. So if that describes you this morning, you are in the right place. Join us. Embrace Jesus. Let's pray together. Jesus, some of us, and I understand why, but some of us would settle for pick-me-ups and that feeling of love without the power of transformation. Another of us may come this morning insulated in fear and preferring to keep you at arm's length to kind of preserve what we have. Help us have the courage to value grace above all, a love that's lit, that all of these words are true, these words of love are true, but with the power to transform our lives, which is what we get when we embrace you, Jesus. So help us this morning embrace you for the first time or embrace you again. We are happy for scraps with whatever you would give us, Jesus. You are our bread, the bread of life. And we love you in Jesus' name. We pray. Amen.